Hello there folks, I'm Dan Brown from Sort of Interesting. You're about to be joining me on good old narrowboat Abel's Ark where I'm going to be answering a few of your random questions about boats and boat life and also asking the wider boating community a few questions of my own because after 10 years afloat I am a clueless idiot. Let's go! <laughs> Don't look at the paintwork. So one of the questions I've had a lot over the years, and in some cases almost gleefully asked by people who I don't think have my best interests at heart, uh, do I worry about the boat sinking? And of course, there's a certain element that you've got to think about that sort of disastrous situation, because after all, you are literally on a steel tube, slowly rusting away in a muddy ditch, basically. So uh, when you put it like that, obviously there's a concern. But I'd say one of my biggest concerns is seasonal, and that is with the winter coming in and lots and lots of snow and wet weather potentially roaming in. If we look back to one of my favourite videos that I've ever posted from all the way back in 2013, we'll see that my first winter on a boat was quite extraordinary. As you can imagine, waking up to this kind of weather was fantastic and truly breathtaking but also a little alarming to see just how much snow had gathered on the boat roofs and how much weight that was adding to them. And something that has always stuck with me about this particular point in my early boat life was over the following weeks hearing that five boats had actually sunk in this snow in the local area alone. And that was partly due to the weight and also probably partly due to the seepage of the long wet winter weather already adding a bit more water weight to the boats. And something that particularly stays with me is that there used to be a lot of condensation form on narrowboat Tilly, which would then pool beneath the floorboards, which I would then pump out every so often. And I've often wondered in this particular winter how much extra weight that water would have added. Do I ever worry that the boat will become unmoored and float away while I'm not here? Well, yes and no, and just a slight curiosity here, some of you may have seen a recent video going around where my chains had actually snapped while I wasn't on board and somebody had luckily retied her nice and tightly and sensibly to the side. So I've just got back to the boat and amazingly for the second time ever on the Langoflin Canal, my mooring chain has snapped. Unbelievable. Luckily, a friendly passerby has saved the day and re-moored her. But it is a slight risk, although the chains, as you can see, are fairly hefty things and it's only happened to me twice in 10 years. But let's take a closer look. When I'm not at the boat, I can be confident that it's not going to come untied for any natural means. However, you can see here that even though these ropes were tied less than three days ago, they're already unbelievably loose, which then allows the boat to start wiggling around a lot more and that's basically because of the high volume of traffic up here on the Langoflin Canal and a lot of boats passing through maybe a little faster than they should have. So however tightly you think you've tied the ropes, obviously that starts to slacken them off. And then the slacker the ropes get, the more play there is so the boat can move around as boats pass by and put more force onto it, making them ever slacker. So. You'll often see me retying the ropes every other day and in a lot of cases over the summer every single day and this is one of those things that does concern me a little bit because you can see just how much play there is in the boat right now and again I've been away for two whole days basically and this is what you come back to and even while I've been here there's been an endless procession of boats seemingly going past. That's actually why the boat's moving around so much at the moment, because there's so much disturbed flow of water. What is the internal headroom of a narrowboat and the widest point internally of a narrowboat? So if you're walking down the towpath, you might have looked at boats and thought, oh, they're pretty low down. And that's basically because we've got our feet well below the waterline here. Now, I've got a own up here. I'm only a short boy. I'm about five foot six or about 167 centimetres. So narrowboat headroom hasn't really been an issue that I've had to worry about. However, you can tell that there isn't much clearance above my, my little bonts here. So I certainly wouldn't want to start doing star jumps or any wild exercises on board. However, if you are a little bit taller than me, you can imagine that making sure you don't clip your head on the little fittings like lights or alarms or vents and stuff can soon become an issue. 
And if we have a look at the highest point of the roof, in the middle of the slightly sort of vaulted curved uh, surface, then we have got a clearance of about 190 centimetres, which is about six foot three. So again, it's surprisingly low to some people, and I know people who've stepped on board this boat and my previous boat, who've had that sort of, not claustrophobic feeling necessarily, but the feeling that they've got a sort of, I don't know, almost sort of fetch their shoulders up in a defensive motion. Now, let's talk about the width. Look at the walls. We've first of all got this step in, which is the gunwale, the step that goes around the perimeter of the narrowboat. And of course, the walls aren't right onto the steel. So you can see just from the window frame there that there's a couple of inches of internal space we lose from the insulation and obviously the wood panelling, etc. So if we look here, hopefully without me clogging up the screen, you can see that below the gunwale, there's a very slight inward tapering of the walls. And again, going from the gunwale upwards towards the ceiling, you can also see we have got the internal tapering towards the ceiling, which is referred to as the tumble home, I believe. Now, that means that you've got two ways to think about this. I personally consider the gunwale, where that sticks out inside the narrowboat, as the sort of usable space, really. But of course, just below that, if you've got furniture such as my little desk and so on, you've got an extra couple of inches from the gunwale that you can sort of cut in with. Let's start off by going gunwale to gunwale. So, we've got about 171 centimetres, or about 5 foot 7 width-wise, between the step from one side to the other. And of course, if you're going to below the gunwale, then if I pop the tape measure out, we're basically taking that 171 centimetre measurement, adding in another nine centimetres each side. So again, some quick maths off the top of my head. Let's call that 198 or 188 centimetres even. So again, 188 centimetres. I don't know the measurements, so that would be about six foot two, give or take. One of the most common areas of doubt when cruising on a boat in normal canal conditions is what do you do if two narrowboats arrive at a bridge or a tunnel from opposite directions at the same time? And this is where I want to open the floor to other boaters to see what they think. Because if I throw up some old footage here of this happening to me in the past, I've actually heard a few different things on this. I was always led to believe that the boat that was going with the flow of water took precedent, as that's a nice simple way that's universal and it removes any element of doubt basically that, oh well, you go with the flow of water and the other boat backs up or pulls to the side or just stays a little bit further behind to leave space for that boat to emerge and carry on cruising. However, when I said that years ago, loads of people piped up saying they'd never heard that and that that was utter nonsense. And uh, well, again, let's investigate this. So this is a really good example of boats meeting at a bridge from back in my good old narrowboat Tilly era, where you can see that the bridge is after a slight kink in the canal. So as the front of the boat approaching me comes into sight, you'll see that obviously the person way back on the tiller is still completely unaware of me being on the other side of the bridge entrance. So here, the flow of water is coming down towards me, so it's being funnelled and pushed through the bridge, which, in my humble opinion, makes it easier for me to reverse back out of the way and for them to just follow the flow of water naturally back through the bridge towards me and past. Now, this is a holiday boat that could well be on its first couple of hours of cruising coming down from Chirk in this particular case. So with that as a potential possibility, I also see it as a case of me backing out and getting out of harm's way from a novice boater who potentially has not had any real experience of boating, so maybe unfamiliar with how the boat will respond to the tiller and so on. So to me, it's also one of those cases of me backing out of harm's way and making life as easy as possible for them to pass through safely. Anyway, what's the general consensus on this? Am I absolutely wrong and completely full of nonsense? Answers on a postcard. Until the next time, my friends, have a fantastic day. Keep it interesting. Keep it boatworthy. Oh yeah, please check the links in the description and buy my books about boat life. Anyway, have a fantastic day, my friends, and farewell.